Good morning. Welcome to Open Church, Open Bible. It's our church school study hour. We're thanking you so much for joining in with us this morning. Please get your Bibles, your, your tablets, your, your iPads, and let's prepare ourselves as we go into our time of study. Eternal Father, we thank you, Lord, for this another day. We thank you for this another first Sunday that we come to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. And we're thanking you, Father, for your word that has been guiding us and instructing us. And Lord, we admit that we don't always, or have not always done what you told us in your word, but thank you for being patient and pointing out to us the failures and faulties in our lives that we can turn to you. Teach us now this lesson, God, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You have your Bibles and you turn to us. Our lesson today is Exodus. We're going to take a step back from our studies from David in this quarter. We're starting and we're looking at God provides manna and quail. Story of God's people going through the wilderness. Uh, take a lot of notes because this may help us. Right now we're in a wilderness moment and the things that we can learn about who God is and what he does will be essential for us as we are to grow and bring others to the kingdom. Exodus chapter 16, and your book uh, starts at verse two. I did start at verse number one. We're gonna read verses one through 15 uh, in its entirety. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At even you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Also Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Moses spoke to Aaron, say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. In the morning, the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. We pose a question uh, that launches us into our study today. How many times have you chosen to see the problem rather than the God who is greater than the problem? We are at a place now where the nation has been brought out of Egypt. And being brought out of Egypt, we're a little over a month out of Egypt. The text tells us that their problem arose. They saw the problem, but they couldn't fix their attention on the God who is greater than the problem. This week's lesson centers on the Exodus sojourn. And God has brought his people out of Egyptian enslavement and they're headed now on their way to the land of promise. 
For those of us who are reading this lesson, it is very easy to be critical of Israel and how they're always complaining about something. But we should consider there's a lot of their behavior is mirrored in our behavior. God had brought them out of bondage. God had given them water previously. Now they needed food. They were always complaining. It's helpful to know that after calling the fugitive murderer Moses uh, out of Midian, that God gave him the assignment of extricating his people from slavery. Even the choice of the one that he would use to bring them out is a little suspect for many of us. For if somebody messes up, often we'll put them aside and figure there's nothing that can be done with them. God is the one who can reclaim anybody, and he did it with Moses. Moses pleaded his inadequacy to God. He knew about his reputation, he knew about his past, and he says, I got, I, you got the wrong one. I'm not the one to carry out this assignment. He told God about his ability. He said, I don't have the ability to do this, God. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not equipped for this. He talked about the fact that I have nothing to say to the people. Who am I to speak to them? I have no message to give to them. He spoke the fact that he had no authority. That's why he asked God, who should I tell him sent me? He needed a name so he would have authority. He talked about the fact I can't speak. There are those that would say he was a stutterer. He says, I'm not eloquent enough to speak to your people. And I have no inclination to do this. I'll just stay here. I'll take care of my father-in-law's cattle here in the wilderness. Leave me alone. No ability, no message, no authority, no eloquence, and no inclination. And yet, God used them. God countered his objections with a promise of presence. You may not have ability, but I'm going to be there with you. He says, you may not have authority, but I'm omnipotent. I'm God Almighty. I'm El Shaddai. You, you may not be able, but I'm your enablement to get you through this. I'm the one that's going to give you divine direction and instruction. All the things that you say you cannot do, God says, I'm going to be there and I'm going to do. Now, that's a great pause point in our lesson because whenever God has given us something to do and, and, and we think that we're inadequate for the assignment, if we in fact go with God, we can make it through. God made seven demands from Pharaoh, uh, all centered around the stranglehold that, uh, that he had upon God's people. He was dominating them in a very strange way, and God wanted his people out of it. Remember, a couple things are going on. Genesis chapter 15, God said that they would be down there in bondage for 400 years until the time of the Amorites be fulfilled. God gave the Amorites an opportunity to turn to him. Repeatedly God said to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. Abad, worship, that's the, way, that's the word it means. Let my people go that they may worship me. Now, Pharaoh and anybody with a Pharaoh mentality ought to be certain not to do anything from hindering somebody else from worshiping God. Let my people go, they may worship me. Notice God did not mention a time. He didn't mention a place, a where, a when, or how long. He simply said, let my people go that they may worship me. The wicked nature that was inside of Pharaoh prompted him to impose even a greater affliction upon God's people. He required that they do the same amount of work with reduced resources. He would not give them straw to help make the brick. They had to do it with reduced resources, but he wanted the same output. He did this, no doubt, to restrict their opportunity and desire to worship this Yahweh God that was making demands of him. Over several months, the Israelites witnessed 10 miraculous plagues or signs of the wrath of God against Egypt. Each one of those plagues was designed to defy a God in Egypt while heightening the superiority of Yahweh. Yahweh said, let my people go that they may come and worship me. Israel with all of, I mean, uh, uh, Egypt with all of its gods, they thought that they were more powerful. So God sent plagues against their gods. The first plague, the blood in the Nile, was one who defied Hapi, who was supposed to be in charge 
of all of the agriculture and things like that. God defied him. The frogs were in defiance of heck. God showed that you think you can control nature, not more than I. The gnats were defying both Isis and Hathor. Again, these gods were supposed, and goddesses were supposed to be in charge of these areas, and God is showing you're not in charge. The very things that you're supposed to be helping your people with and, and protecting them against, you can't protect them. The flies, same thing, Isis and Hathor. When God sent the murrain where the cattle started to get sick and, and the disease started to spread through the land, he was against Ta and Apis. And it's amazing that this very God is the one that they built a copy of when they got out in the wilderness. But God showed them, I am defying these gods of Asia. When he sent the boils, he was also defying Ta and Apis. When he sent the hail, he was really defying all of the gods. I'm in control of the things of the heavens, things that come from above. And all of these things God was saying, I want you to know Jehovah is in control. When he sent the locusts, same thing. He is defying all of the gods. I, they said it covered the earth and you could not even see the ground. God was defying all of their gods. When he sent the darkness, he was defying all of their gods. When you start to look at how this, uh, uh, the plagues are escalating in their severity, he is defying all of the gods, but there's still one more God that he has to take care of. When God sent the death of the firstborn, he was defying Pharaoh because Pharaoh considered himself to be a god. They considered Pharaoh a god. God sent plagues to defy all of the gods of Egypt. And because of that, we're going to see what God does as he extricates his people out of the land of Egypt. It was through these divine judgments that God brought about the release of the captives. And as they released them, they, had to, they gave them. They were so happy to see them go. They gave them what's, what equates to what we call reparation. They gave them gold. They gave them silver. They gave them valuables to take with them. After evidencing the, the mighty power of God and enunciating the name of God and experiencing the provision of God, we come back to our original query. How many times have we chosen to see the problem rather than the God who is greater than the problem? Remember, God has already showed his mighty power over Egypt when he defied all their gods. And Israel, in our story, has already experienced the providential hand of God leading them out of the land of Egypt. They've experienced it, they've evidenced it, and yet, when the next problem comes, they forget what God did last time. Even their final deliverance, which occurred at the Red Sea, was a test of their faith. Was, God wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. They were looking. They saw bad things when they got to the Red Sea. They had gotten the reparations. They had their cattle. They had the, over 2 million uh, Israelites came out of Egypt. And yet they get to this river and they went by sight and not by faith. They saw mountains on one side. They saw deserts on the other side. They saw Pharaoh's army coming up behind them in chariots. And they saw a body of water in front of them. Things looked desperate. In fact, remember even Moses himself got a little shaky. God told him to take the rod that was in his hand and stretch it out. And he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In spite of what they ex had experienced, they still was a complaining brood. So our lesson outline is, one, we're going to look at the people's complaint. Then we're going to look at the people's, the, excuse me, the Lord's response. The people complained, the Lord responded, and finally we're going to look at the Lord's provision to their complaints. The people's complaint. Israel took their journey from Elim, Elim means palm trees, where they had remained several days. They came into the wilderness of Zen, or Sin, uh, where it means to be seen or thorn. They're going to be pricked. They're going to be tested. Uh, it's identified with the wilderness of Kadesh in Numbers chapter 33. They took their journey from Elim, and now they have come to this place where there's, there's a problem that arises. It appears from the information we get from Numbers chapter 32 that there were several stations of, of occurrences are omitted 
in this Exodus story, Numbers relates it to us. So between the two, we'll be able to get a good picture, a profile of what went on. Despite past expressions of care and covering, the whole congregation begins to complain against leadership. They're complaining against Aaron and Moses. At this juncture in their flight, they're, they're just more than 30 days from leaving. Uh, their storage of corn and other provisions are almost exhausted. There's no prospect of procuring anymore because you're heading out into the wilderness. They, they would have no resort. There's, there's no wild uh, uh, olives. There is no honey. There was nothing. Uh, that's, that's all they would have to eat would, would be that wild stuff and nothing that they brought with them. Travelers in this region were known that when you're traveling through this wilderness desert, this desert dry region, you would take as much as 40 days of provision. You would take enough food to get you through it. They had cattle, but they couldn't slaughter the cattle because slaughtering the cattle would detract from the long-term benefit of receiving the milk and the cheese. What do we do? They're between a rock and a hard place. And so they complain. Things are running out. Things are running short. All we got are wild olives and honey to eat, according to Deuteronomy 32. And they started to complain. After the water crisis, and back in chapter 15, and before the next water crisis in chapter 17, they now face a food crisis. As you can see, water, food, water. One major thing in Amid thoughts to the next. And watch how they handle this. As they're complaining, we are excited to say that God does provide for them again. But this time he provides them with manna and with quail. First currents was water and Moses was able to hit the rock and water gushed out of the rock. He tamillied the rock and water gushed out of the limestone so they could drink. Now they're at a place where they need food and God is going to send manna and quail. Despite this, however, they continue to have problems trusting God's ability to provide for them. Uh, we find that God gives a certain way he wanted them to gather the food. Don't, get a, don't just get a day's worth at a time. In, our, in, the, in, the, in the disciples' prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Same thought. God provided food for them day by day. Despite, despite the proof of God's force uh, that he has over nature, they start to complain. Thereby demonstrating a lack of faith in God's divine power and God's providence. They, they are complainers. They, 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 after God had already done something for them, after he'd already brought them out, they're complainers. In Exodus 16, 3, the people said they would have preferred to have died by natural causes, by the hand of Yahweh or of old age back in Egypt. While you're a slave, they would have rather died while enslaved over their current situation where they're hungry. They said they never wanted for food when they were in Egypt because they sat by the flesh pots. They had the time to cook the meals, cook the meat, and eat it. They said we had, but they forgot about the fact that they were slaves. They were in bondage. They, they, they would do this in the midst of the journey too, by the way. They would remember all the leeks and the salad and the garlic and things they had back in Egypt. But you're free now. You're no longer under bondage. As the people are complaining, as they are raising up their uh, dissatisfaction with their current condition, God speaks. God responds. These people had a poor memory. If you just think back where God has brought you from and just think about how good things are. Look, things may not be perfect in our country right now, but just think about where we came from. These, these Israelites had a bad memory. They had been away from the bondage of Egypt just over a month, and they had forgotten about the mercies of God. He's a God of mercy, and he is a God of favor. Old Testament, New Testament, grace. They murmured against Moses and God, chapter 15. And interestingly, God responded without any indication in our text that Moses or anyone else spoke to him. They murmured, and as God is not only growing the people, and he's growing Moses and Aaron, he's growing leadership at the same time. The Bible tells us, and we don't see anything where anybody called on the name of God, oh God help us, 
God simply responded. He simply showed up. Verse 4 could well have read, I'm going to rim, uh, send fire and brimstone on you because you're always complaining. It didn't. God responded in a very graceful way to these people. He proved his love toward them by raining bread from heaven upon them. Now, when you look at Psalm 78, 24, and 25, and, and Psalm 105, Nehemiah 9, they all tell the story of how God rained bread down from heaven. He rained some sustenance down for them so they could eat. Someone has calculated that in order to supply an omer, or 5.2 pints of manna, for 2 million people daily, would require four freight trains of 60 cars each. How kind of God to know what his people need and supply that need. Beloved, the enormity of the assignment to send enough manna down where everybody was able to capture an omer and have bread to eat. God has the calculation perfect. The phrasing of verse number six of our lesson is virtually identical to that associated with the Passover which commemorated deliverance at the death of the firstborn of Egypt and the release from captivity. God wants them to remember that I'm the one who's providing this. I'm the one who's going to see to it that you live. I did it back in Egypt because I controlled death. I'm doing it now because I'm providing food. God is the one who controls life and death. Moses and Aaron rebuked the people because they were grumbling against them, verse number seven in our text. And they were grumbling against Moses and Aaron and were grumbling against the Lord, verse number eight. And they reassured them that God's provision would always come when there's a, a need. God knows how to provide for needs, which caused the community to know that he is the Lord, their God. He is the Lord, he's the one, the master, he's the one that's over. He is the God that provides. He's, he's Jehovah Yireh, the God that makes provision. He's the God that sees to it, the God that provides. Verse 8, and, uh, and look at 12 through 13. It says the bread came early in the morning. Actually, it came during the night, uh, according to Numbers 11 and 9. Now, no discrepancy. It came during the night. When they got up in the morning, the bread was there. And it melted in the heat of the day. It came overnight, they get up in the morning, they go get the bread. When they got the bread and ate the bread, whatever was left, it would melt in the heat of the day. But no worry, when you start to trust God, if you ate today, you'll be able to eat tomorrow. Each day, they would gather only enough bread for that particular day. This meant that they would have to trust God that there's gonna be food out there tomorrow morning. Notice, God gave the bread freely, but they had to retrieve it from the ground. That's very important. They would end up being an agrarian people. God wanted, he was getting them ready. He was getting them prepared for the idea that you've got to retrieve it from the ground. That is, you've got to work. You've got to get out and work for what you're going to get. And we, we talk a lot about the atrocities going on in our nation right now, and it's, it's really sad when, we're, we're, when our people are shot by police. It's also sad when they're shot by people who won't get out and get a job. Now, it's also sad that the, that the system won't provide jobs on a fair and equitable basis to everyone. So we're in this quandary right now of so many different things going on and the desperation that people have. I, I remember one time when I was, I was not working and I recalled something that I had learned when I was a boy. If I have to pick up bottles along the road, if I have to, if I have to uh, cut grass, I was going to provide for my family. We were going to eat. We were going to have provision. God says, go out. I'm going to send the bread, but you got to go out, and you got to retrieve it from the ground. God asked Moses a question back in verse number four. God says to Moses, will they go according to my law or not? I'm going to prove, nasa. I'm going to test them. I'm going to try them. I'm going to see whether they'll listen to what I say. God asked that question because God already knew. There would be some who would not listen to God. They would try and gather up extra, and, and it, would, it would rock. It would, it would go bad uh, because if we listen to God and do it his way, 
it works out perfectly. God would not only satisfy their hunger, God would also test their character. In what God does for us and the provisions that he makes for us, it becomes a test of our character. Are we really trusting God or are we trusting our own devices? Are we really, uh, do we think we're so smart that we're the ones that can make this happen? Or do we trust God that he knows better than we do about what our real needs are? The test foreshadows the Sabbath that would come, will become a law. Remember, he told them to gather uh, every day for the one day. And then on the sixth day, they had to gather extra on, this, on that day in order they'd have. Because when it was time for Shabbat, when it was time for Sabbath rest, is a, watch this. The same thing that rotted yesterday will stay today because I am trusting God. I'm doing it the way he said do it. If I, if I collected two days worth on the third day, it would rot. Or the fourth day. But on the sixth day, it'll last. God was, was setting them up for understanding that there was a Sabbath day of rest. The phrasing in chapter 16, verse 7, in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, was very similar to what God said when they were leaving Egypt. When the deaf angel was passing over, he said, in the morning you will see the salvation of the Lord. God, overnight, while you and I sleep, he's protecting us, but God is setting the stage tomorrow for what some wonderful thing he's going to do to glorify himself. God said, it says, you shall see the glory of the Lord, the, 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 the Chabud Yehovah, or Yahweh. You shall see the presence of the Lord. You shall see the glory of the Lord right where you are. This should have jolted them to realize that they were questioning the ability of the same God who had brought them out of Egypt. They were questioning his provision his ability to provide for them when they're in the wilderness. He's the God in Egypt. He is Jeho Jehovah in the wilderness. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. He's God everywhere. Moses told the people, listen, God heard you murmuring. Chapter 14, verse 27, and Numbers tells the same thing. And, and God's going to give you the bread. The Lord also answered the desire to meet that evening. Murmuring uh, is, is a word means complaining. It means grumbling in the sense of being obstinate. Uh, God heard your murmuring. You, you, you don't really know what you're complaining about, but you're complaining. And, and you're always complaining. Uh, the complaints are all, always against something or someone. Uh, Toluna is always against something or someone. Ultimately, it was against God. They were complaining against Moses and Aaron, but their ultimate complaint was against God. They were casting aspersions on God's justice. They were casting aspersions on his goodness and his power. And therefore, their murmuring became an open act of rebellion and disbelief and disobedience. Murmuring, complaining, is a sinful act of distrust in God. Numbers 14, verses 22 33, tells us, Because of all those men who had seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt, and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times God was counting ten times God says because you tempted me you have not hearkened to my voice surely all of you complainers will not see the land which I swear unto their fathers and neither shall any of them that provoked me see it God said all the ones who are complaining you won't get to rest you won't get to have the rest of Canaan that's what Canaan was a place of rest you won't get to be at peace and have rest in Canaan because you're always complaining. The Lord then instructed Moses in our text of Exodus 16 to gather the people before him. And they were able to witness in, a, in a, some ocular way. God gave an ocular demonstration of his presence. It does not appear that uh, we are any different than the Israelites. We are so much like them, we don't like to admit it. But we're very much like them. We're quick to complain about God rather than praise him for what he has done. Thanking him enormously for yesterday's manna, yesterday's quail. And, and, and though I may not have it tomorrow, Lord, I thank you right now for what I have. That's why it's important. When, we, when you're eating, bless the food. Father, we thank you for this food that's been prepared for us. Bless God. God remains faithful and gracious to us in spite of us. 
Exodus 16 should be read in connection with John 6. For the manna from heaven is a type of Jesus Christ, the bread of life. When God's people were traveling in the wilderness to the land of promise, they needed manna. We are traveling through the wilderness in this world, heading for the land of promise, heaven, and we need manna, for he is the bread of life. Bread of heaven, is, as uh, Hammond sings, Fred Hammond sings, sent down from glory. He is the bread of heaven. So the lesson that you can learn from this lesson is look at and teach the similarity between what God provided to Israel when they were traveling in the wilderness to what God provided for us and his, is providing for us as we are on our wilderness journey. It also illustrates that the written word of God on which God's pilgrim people feed comes day to day. Don't think that you can live simply by reading the Bible on Sunday when you come to worship. Every day you ought to spend some time in the word of God. God sent manna, his word, his bread, which is representative of the Christ. And every day, give us this day our daily bread. We ought to spend time in the word of God every day. Another lesson is the Hebrew word manna means what is it? The statement of the Jews when they could not explain this new food that came from heaven. Notice the similarity, beloved. When Jesus came, they also did not know who he was. They did not know who, what the provision was in the wilderness. And when Christ came, they also did not know who is this or what is this. These lessons from the lesson can be elaborated on to become lessons unto themselves. And it may help you as you're going through your study uh, and preparing to teach this lesson. First thing, lesson, is that Jesus is the man. Second lesson is the word of God needs to be consumed daily. Third lesson is they didn't know what it was. And so Israel to today as a nation does not count Jesus as Savior. When you look at 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes, great is the, is, the, is the mystery of godliness. Consider how the manner pictures Jesus, who was God manifest in flesh. Questions you may want to survey and it will help you to advance your learning. When they arrived at the wilderness of sin, I think that's an that's a interesting uh, play on words, zen, sin, what was the implication of their claim that, would, that it would have been better to, for them to die in, in, in back in Egypt? Why, why would they say that? Second question, in light of the previous examples of God's provision and care, why would they issue a complaint against the Lord's workers? Why, why would they blame Moses and Aaron? for what they were going through and enduring. Number three, what assurance would the people receive from God's provision? And in what way did the provision test the people? There are some, some, some evaluation, character evaluations going on. In what way did that happen? And number four, how long did God's provision continue? Did they have manna forever and ever, or did it stop at some point? And what is the significance of the name that they gave to it? What is it? I pray that those questions will help not only advance your knowledge, but give you some fuel for fodder. That as you're studying, it'll help you increase your own application of things you're going to put to the lesson. Again, I want to thank you for joining in our church school hour. We ask if you would please join us this morning in worship at 10 a.m. It is first Sunday. We are going to be celebrating the Lord, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you'd like a copy of this lesson, just go to our website, and the information is here. Go to the website and go to the church school tab, and you'll be able to pull down a PDF of the lesson. Thank you so much for joining us. See you at 10 o'clock. Father, we thank you that we were able to come to a knowledge that Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. We thank you, God, that we are able to come to the knowledge that we know who he is and why he came. We thank you, God, that because of all that you care for us, you make provisions when we don't even know where it's coming from. We thank you, God, for your love, for your care, and for your concern of your people. Continue to be with us, Lord. Guide us and protect us. And we ask this all in the matchless, mighty, and marvelous name of your son, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
Amen. Be blessed. Don't forget, I will see you at 10 a.m. Have a blessed Lord's Day.